In the southwestern desert of Navisgain, many dangers await bold scavengers and the long dead alike. Aside from the scorching heat, there's aggressive wildlife, equally aggressive plant life, uh, ruins on the brink of collapse, and mine-ridden, zombie-infested, restricted-access military installations. Welcome to Episode 3 of the Untold Stories of Navisgain. In this series, we're going to explore and dissect the most interesting places in the default setting of Seven Days to Die. From mountaintop mansions to fortified factories, we're going to learn the stories of those who didn't make it. Today, our search for the lesser known brings us to the Red Mesa Military Fortress. Well, fortress is a bit of a strong word, but in terms of what's left of Navisgain, not too far from the truth. Upon entering this restricted zone, a couple of observations can immediately be made. Firstly, we'll get this one out of the way, Red Mesa is a pretty direct reference to the Black Mesa research facility of the Half-Life universe. But second, unlike many of the locations we'll explore, this place has held up relatively well considering current circumstances. The sturdy walls have held up, the checkpoint is still together, even the American flag is, well, weathered, but intact. So why, then, does it seem nobody's home? If there were any place you'd expect to find survivors in an apocalypse of any kind, really, a military installation would be high on the list. Well, there's nobody here to check our ID, so let's make our way across the bridge so as to avoid the rows of still intact landmines, and take a stab at figuring out what's happened here. Once inside, we have a few options to choose from when selecting an entrance to the facility proper. In the interest of time, I'll speed things along here just a little bit. Immediately before us, we have what appears to be a ramp to allow vehicle access to whatever lies below. Here, we'll find our first signs of serious damage to the area, though it doesn't look like something that would allow the undead to flood into the compound. Following the ramp to its end, we can find a rusted iron door with most of a zombie lying defeated just beyond it. This door has direct line of sight on the hole in the wall, so... Being in a military installation, it might be safe to assume that we're looking at damage not done by zombies, but by very well-armed people fighting with explosives on the retreat. It's worth mentioning, however, there's only one corpse here. If there were an epic struggle for survival accompanied by a barrage of bullets and a series of explosions, we'd expect to see... more. The structure circumvented by the ramp appears to be a simple entrance to the facility below and elevator and some stairs are most of what there is to see here. The other most apparent structure appears to serve two functions. Firstly, given the electric relay, satellite dish, and equipment inside, this was most likely a center for communications. However, nestled into the center of this structure is a very healthy cache of weapons and ammunitions, though we can't say for sure, this doesn't seem like a whole lot for the size of this installation, so it's quite possible most of the ammunition was used by the personnel left alive here before their inevitable end. Before we delve into the facility proper any further, however, there is one more hard-to-miss feature of this place that should be mentioned. Two protrusions jutting out from the facility below, marked very warningly in red. Looking down one, it seems to be sealed off. The other, however, is left gaping open still. Notably, this is the only obvious point of entry for zombies to make their way into the facility, but most zombies' legs aren't quite sturdy enough to carry them past the fall. I have a feeling we know what this once housed, but I think it's time we entered the facility. Entering through the central structure, we find what appears to be the garage. A couple of military trucks, a couple of zombies, and possibly a light trail of the defeated undead decorate the area. Once we make it beyond the parking, however, the immensity of this underground fortress begins to take hold. Within this fortress, starting on level minus one, we can find what appears to be a checkpoint or office, a storage room, and access to what are now very clear to us as missile silos. It appears one missile is still here, the other, however, will have to come back to that. On level minus two, this dead place begins to show signs of life. A mess hall and a kitchen, bathrooms, a small lounging area, more storage, and a control room of some kind, very likely for our missiles. Continuing down, we'll find the bottom of this installation, level minus three where the immensity of the one remaining missile is most apparent and terrifying. Down here we'll also find more storage, a room for exercise, a room for laundry, a shower room conveniently placed near the gym, 
and two barracks, each capable of housing 14 staff, soldiers, or whoever once dwelt here among the living. So with the full scope of this installation in mind, what can we gather? First, let's try and figure out what happened to the people here. When it comes to the places we'll visit in this series, this is actually quite a unique one in that I don't see any obvious ways this place would have been overrun by the Horde. The checkpoint and the bridge at the front are intact, the trench surrounding the base is still full of very active landmines, the walls have held up, there are no obvious breaches in the security of our facility here, except for the open silo. It is possible that some particularly tough zombies managed to jump, or let's be honest, more likely fall down through the open silo and slowly bash themselves into the concrete wall forming this hole and eventually this tunnel giving them direct access to the innermost areas of this base. The bedrooms, the showers, the lounging areas, or even the small gym. Anywhere people would be the least on their guard. However, there is one detail here that makes me doubt that slightly. This light. If zombies truly did slowly tunnel their way to victory, why is this here? If the horde flooded in, why or how would anyone manage to set this up? The placement of this fixture leads me to believe this wasn't actually a zombie dug tunnel, but a man-made one. For what purpose those in this facility would dig such a tunnel is unclear, so perhaps this is a detail we can hand wave. But it is pretty cool to imagine some scenario where they were ordered to launch one of their missiles, but it turned out there was a problem, something wasn't working. With launch protocols initiated, the doors leading into the silos were already sealed shut and couldn't be unsealed, so the dutiful soldiers did what they could. They broke a wall down and tunneled to the missile to fix it. But that story requires us to make a lot of frankly silly assumptions, so with Occam's Razor we'll probably have to shave that off of our list. It's much more likely than that zombies did in fact fall and tunnel their way into the facilities. Then, as per usual, through a path of open doors and busted walls, we can see their trail of destruction. One more detail here, though. Access to the next level up is currently sealed off. Perhaps some managed to escape. We can hope. Now, with the fate of this base's occupants better understood, that only leaves one more mystery to investigate. Possibly one of the most important mysteries to find in all of Nava's game. The missile. Where is it? What is it? Was it launched? If so, where did it land? And why was it launched in the first place? When was it launched? What... what happened? Let's start from the most obvious. Was the missile launched? While we can't be entirely certain, it's very likely that it was. Other possibilities would involve it being scrapped or never there in the first place, but once again, the fewer assumptions the better. As I've mentioned in a previous video, spread throughout Navisgain, one can find shreds of newspapers, most likely the most recent editions, and the last ones. Due to their resolution, they're mostly illegible, but one of said newspapers very clearly starts with nuclear something. We can't gather much more than that, but just below that headline is what to me very clearly seems to be a photo of a mushroom cloud. So that most likely answers our first few questions. The missing missile in question was most likely in fact a nuclear device and was almost certainly used as intended, well, mostly. I have a feeling zombie apocalypse wasn't exactly in any of the manuals contained within the Red Mesa installation, but hey, I didn't work there, what do I know? Regardless, this newspaper is actually also a bit of a clue as to our timeline here. If there was a nuclear detonation and newspapers had enough time to print and distribute the story, it's quite likely the blast actually occurred before the zombie apocalypse came into full swing. This informs the why of the launch. Or possibly. Sort of. Probably. I'm sorry, this is a lot of conjecture, but bear with me. I'm actually going to slightly contradict some conjecture I made in an older video here. The same video I mentioned before, and the very one that probably brought a lot of you here one way or another. Originally, I considered it most likely that nuclear detonations occurred within Navisgain and were self-inflicted wounds made in an attempt to quell the zombie outbreak. This idea is evidenced by radiation-infested zombies, entirely decimated and burnt landscapes, and the radiation that locks us within Navisgain. But I think it wasn't quite that simple now. 
Many have mentioned to me in comments on that previous video that Seven Days to Die takes place in not just a zombie apocalypse, but a post-World War III setting. There isn't any in-game evidence to support this as far as I'm aware, but an old description of the game and original teasers and trailers did describe it as such. However, there isn't any clear ground zero of a nuclear blast within Navisgain, at least not as far as I've seen. There are sites where it's possible an air detonation occurred, but that would probably be the least effective means of wiping out a county of zombies. There's plenty of evidence of explosives, incendiaries, destruction only full military might could cause, but no direct evidence of a nuclear detonation within the playable game map. With that in mind, I think what actually happened here was the following. As a new zombie flu or virus sweeps across the globe, tensions due to national lockdowns and economic downturn run high. As entire nations point fingers blaming each other for the species-threatening pandemic, a breaking point is reached and military action is taken. After enough had died and the zombie virus began to grip entire regions, drastic measures were taken. Someone in power somewhere decided to push the button. A nuclear warhead carrying device was launched, for one reason or another, and the world powers reacted. In a moment of desperation, simply following orders, the staff of the Red Mesa military installation launched one of their possibly nuclear ICBMs. Not into Navisgain, but toward a foreign land. For whatever reason, the other was never launched. Soon after, with global destruction crippling all major powers, the zombie virus, empowered by nuclear radiation, began to wipe out those who could not defend themselves. The remaining staff of the Red Mesa facility held their post until the bitter end, until through the open blast door, zombies pooled in and smashed their way through, taking those that couldn't escape and sending the rest to their doom elsewhere. Regardless of what happened here, there is still a very large missile housed within this fallen fortress, and I don't want to be around to find out what it's capable of. So until next time, Thank you for watching. Hey, I just wanted to add a quick addendum here at the end of the video to address a few things, so if you're still watching, stay tuned for just another minute if you'd be so kind. Firstly, thank you again for watching. These videos take quite a while to make, and I appreciate the positive feedback they've been receiving. Speaking of, if you do particularly enjoy these kinds of videos on my channel, be sure to let me know by subscribing if you haven't already, leaving a like on the video, and letting me know in the comments where in Navisgain you'd like for me to explore next. I'm always looking for the next thing. I know every YouTuber says all of that far too often, but it's because we can see the analytics on those things and it really does help to inform what kind of content our audiences are enjoying the most, so thank you for all of it. Lastly, before I go, I just wanted to address something I've recently done that I've remained mostly silent about. I have started a Patreon for my channel. I guess the goal is to eventually have a small dedicated group funding videos like these so I can do it full time. If you're at all interested, please take a look at the page using the link shown in the video now and maybe help me make these videos more often. There are certain benefits to each patrons here that I'd like to thank patrons with, but several of them are dependent on there being more than a few people, so the more people that sign up, the more worth it it can be for everyone. I could talk a lot more about Patreon, but I think I'd like to wait for the channel to grow a bit more before I take that terrifying leap and make a dedicated video or something, so I'll end it here. Thank you again for your time and consideration, and I hope to see you soon in the next video.